The agenda this week sat down with Canadian Academy Award-winning filmmaker Daniel War about his documentary, Navalny. Heard from Nobel Prize-winning journalist Maria Ressa on standing up to dictators and assess China's growing presence in the Middle East. The Agenda's Week in Review begins examining why some big-time drug cases collapse. Maybe you could give us some of your, draw on your experience to tell us how these big, high-profile cases get started in the first place. What do the cops do? Well, it's a fascinating perspective from my position now to think about how these investigations begin. I, in this particular case, I have no information whatsoever other than what I've read in the media. And I've read one source that talks about this misleading information, but other sources talking about problems with witnesses and problems with disclosure, which are not police issues per se. But these cases begin usually with some sort of opportunity that presents itself, and it can come from any source whatsoever. It can come from another law enforcement agency. It can come from another police department. It can come from an intelligence agency. It can come from an, an agency from another country. And the media reports I read on this is there's multiple police departments within, within the province of Ontario, plus the RCMP and the Canadian Border Service Agency, plus there's cooperation with the uh, U.S. Department of Homeland Security and uh, Drug Enforcement Agency. So there are a lot of moving parts in, the, in this investigation which are very, very difficult to control. And what I wanted to make an observation was that there were 20 people charged in Canada with offenses. But I've never been aware of our friends in the United States allowing an opportunity to prosecute someone for a crime committed in their jurisdiction to go by the wayside without their best efforts as well. So I don't know if in fact there are people charged in other jurisdictions outside of Canada. So we're not, I'm not convinced on the face of the media reports that the case is totally over, but certainly the Crown has exercised its um, its position to say there's no reasonable prospect of conviction in Canada. And what they're saying is there, there's something problematic with the case that means that the prosecution will not be able to prove this beyond a reasonable doubt. Okay. If they can't prove beyond a reasonable doubt, then they can't pro they can't further the prosecution. Sure. Let me get the, the the media's role in this was just hinted at there. So Peter Edwards, let me go to you on that. Can can you tell when you're in the midst of covering some big photo op event like this uh, whether press coverage is going to be at all a factor in determining whether or not a case goes forward or doesn't? Um, to be honest, no, because we don't know who the informer is. We don't know what else the informer is doing. There's a, a guy I'm talking to now who's in witness protection who was a, a witness in uh, multiple cases, and that's a lot of times the um, what happens if police get someone good, they, they milk them. Um, you know, they, you get all you can out of them, and sometimes these aren't people picked from the front pew of the church. I mean, they're doing, <laughs> doing things on their own that are pretty questionable, or else they're trying to get revenge on people they didn't get along with when they were on the streets. So there's um, a lot of moving parts. Um, sometimes the worst person is the first one to uh, turn informer. Can I get you to look into your history a bit on this one and whether or not any, any media coverage of a trial raised enough serious questions that either the judge or the Crown or whatever thought this can't go forward anymore? It, it can. I mean, I, you know, we, we hope that, that, um, that the courts and Crowns and everyone are, are impervious to public uh, reaction, but, but we're all human, mm -hmm. uh, and so it can. I mean, I don't know, I wouldn't point to a specific case, because I think it would be unfair. I think it would be just a guess on, on my part, but uh, some cases, hundreds and thousands of cases go through the criminal justice system that are not seen by the press. Mm -hmm. uh, and so it would be an interesting test to see whether or not a case that got resolved in a particular way, if the press got hands of it, whether it would have been a different outcome at the end of the day. Uh, but I think that it, it, it can be impactful, uh, ultimately, and that's probably why there is an uproar, because this is identified as the largest drug bust in the history of Canada, and now all of a sudden it seemingly uh, has fallen apart. Uh, and so what happened? And so there is a wanting to know what are the police doing and why has it happened? Uh, and there, just a point of clarification, because I think it is an important legal point on the difference between two powers that the Crown has. 
One is to be able to withdraw. Mm -hmm. uh, and a withdrawal does identify that there is no uh, reasonable prospect of conviction, and so they are taking that position. In this case, it was a stay, a Crown stay. Uh, and in, in that case, the Crown does not have to say or can it even be suggested as to why. It's just a power that the Crown has to say, we're stopping this. So a stay we, is different from a withdrawal of charges? I think meaningfully so by way of how you might interpret it. Uh, if the Crown believed that they had no reasonable prospect of conviction, I think the appropriate one would have been a withdrawal. In this case, it was a stay. It just shut it down. Crown has no obligation to explain why or the reasons behind that. And so we're left to wonder. In Navalny, I, f I found one of the most compelling and charismatic politicians, political figures today. Here's a guy who literally survived an assassination attempt. He's like the guy who lived, the guy Putin couldn't kill, and he was planning to go back. It's, it's like, it's Shakespearean, the scope and scale of this story. It's like a Greek epic, and I identified that from the first moment. So the story is one thing. It's one thing to have the overview of an amazing story and to know that. But the other ingredient that's really incredible for documentary making is that here was a story that very clearly had a beginning, middle, and end. We had this assassination attempt, this, this crazy whodunit, followed by this guy's decision to return to Russia. So we, we knew as we were filming that we had a natural conclusion to this story, which isn't always the case in documentary making. And most importantly, when you sit across from Navalny and you chat with him, he has this quality that is often ascribed to master politicians. When you meet someone who has an extraordinary lightness and charisma, and within 20 minutes, within two minutes, you're convinced this guy could be the president. Mm -hmm. Navalny has that thing, that quality. And so I saw in him an extraordinary subject, and it was just incumbent upon us to do everything we could to deliver the best possible film. And you did. It's a tremendous uh, achievement you. in filmmaking. And I want to show one of the scenes right sure. now that is crazy. This is the, you know what scene I'm going to show. Sure. This is the crazy scene. Navalny is pretending to be a high-ranking Russian FSB secretary. It's a prank call. He's calling the Kremlin hit squad that poisoned him. They confess in the middle of the call to having attempted to murder him. Here's that call. Sheldon, roll it if you would. 10 minutes of your time is very important. Мне нужно э, один абзац, просто краткое понимание от членов команды, что у нас пошло не так, почему в Томске был с Навальным полный провал. Ну, вот это вот я просто без удовольствия уже не один раз, кстати. Ну, я оцениваю работу хорошую, по крайней мере, ну, работа сделала как бы, ну, как, как вот сделали, как бы, мы там все прорабатывали, все вопрос, и не один раз. Ну, в нашей работе, сами понимаете, вопросов и нюансов всегда очень много, и все учитывать, как бы, ну... Какой предмет одежды-то, на какой предмет одежды главный был акцент? На самый, самый рискованный в теории предмет одежды какой? Ну, трусы. И где это паховая часть. Паховая части трусов? Ну, гучи, так называемые, там, там швы такие есть. I mean, you know, you can't make this stuff but up. But I have an act. Like, I, it's still unbelievable to me. And you've seen that a thousand I've times. I've seen it a thousand times. Yeah. And it's still, it, it has the same cognitive dissonance now that it did when we shot that scene. Well, Daniel, here's the thing. I mean, you can see the reaction of the people in the room. Now, you don't speak Russian. Not so a word. You, kn you know something's going on. Yeah. But you don't know what's going on, I guess, right? Well, I was, I, there were two cameras shooting that day. Nikki Waddle, our extraordinary Austrian DP, and I were, were filming that scene. And we had no expectations anything meaningful would happen. You know, I, I presume pretty early on in spy school, they tell you not to blab on an open, unsecured line <laughs> to someone you cannot verify the identity of. Mm. But lo and behold, about an hour into our shoot that morning, the conversation was progressing further than it had before. And I, I recognized that, that whoever was, was on the other end of the line was engaging in a way that the other phone calls had not worked out. And then I noticed that Maria Pevchik, who's Navalny's chief investigator, who's the, the young woman in that clip, her jaw unhinges and hits the floor. And up until that moment, Maria's you know, emotional range, as I had seen it, had been like mildly annoyed to very annoyed. That was the, the spectrum of how she behaved towards me. And so to see this look of utter shock, 
you didn't have to speak a word of Russian to understand that something truly extraordinary was transpiring. And, you know, I just, I just remember a lightning bolt shooting up and down my spine and, and I understood what was happening and I just made sure we had enough battery in the cameras <laughs> and that we were in focus and we just kept shooting. I'm going to start with a map here. Sheldon, you want to bring this up? This is the state of democracy today in the world. This is a new report from the independent Varieties of Democracy Institute. That's out of the University of Gothenburg in Sweden. And it shows 72% of the world's population, that's 5.7 billion people, now live under autocracies. And that is a 46% increase from just a decade ago. The worst decline is happening in the Asia Pacific region, where it's reached 1978 levels. In other words, more than 35 years of global democratic advances have been erased in the last decade. Maria Ressa, what is killing democracy in your view? Oh, I mean, for me, the, the, the fire that set the kindling on fire is technology. And the after technology platforms took over the distribution of information, of news, we saw um, a, a, an overemphasis on profit at all costs. There was an abdication of responsibility of the public sphere. That kind of advertising marketing system, which was the way it was originally set up, was exploited by geopolitical power. We are electing illiberal leaders to democracy globally. If we don't take the right steps forward, if we don't fix the corruption of our information ecosystem, this is going to continue accelerating and, and really D-Day is 2024. Because? Because between now and then, there will be 90 elections globally, right? We don't have integrity of facts. A 2018 MIT study said that lies spread six times faster than facts on social media. Hmm. You know, you add fear, anger, hate, and you will spread even faster. That's the incentive structure. So the incentive structure is upside down. The new gatekeepers have said, lie. I'll reward you, keep lying, I'll keep rewarding you. What kind of, if you were doing that to a child, what kind of adult does that person become? Well, now we're seeing we're in the upside down and while everything is deceptively familiar, the incentive structure rewards the lies, rewards hate. This is part of what has led to 72% of the world under authoritarian rule. This is not a new phenomenon, though, because I, I can't remember who said it, but there's this famous quote about a lie can get all the way around the world before the truth has a chance to put its pants on. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so what's different? Social media has made it different in what way? The pace. The speed. It's exponential. Yeah. It's the pace and the, and the quantity. Right, so big data, just moving to big data from an Excel sheet to big data. And I think we don't quite fathom that, right? Big data allows, for example, uh, in the case, in my case, 90 hate messages per hour to pound me to silence. Mm. There, information has not just been corrupted, it's been weaponized. And for those free speech advocates, we are free speech advocates, mm -hmm. but we are also gatekeepers with a set of standards and ethics. Without these, when information is weaponized, when it's used to take your narrative out and replace it, it's, it's how democracy begins to die and has died. That word gatekeepers has become a bit of a swear word in Canada, I have to say. The, the leader of the Conservative Party of Canada today uses it very effectively, I should add, as a, as a pejorative thing. He says, enough of the gatekeepers. Uh, y y you gatekeepers are the people who are keeping too many Canadians down, and not everybody's getting a chance to participate in democracy adequately because of that. Does he have a point? No. <laughs> no <laughs> because, look, um, there's something, regardless of whatever opinion you have, there's a set of facts. And what's happened is when lies spread faster than facts, uh, you, you begin, there are no facts. You say a lie a million times, it becomes a fact, right? So the three sentences I've said over and over since the, in the no, including in the Nobel lectures, if you, without facts, you can't have truth. Without truth, you can't have trust. Without these three, we have no shared reality. We can't begin to solve a problem. We can't have a conversation. You can't deal with climate change. You cannot have democracy. Why are gatekeepers important? Because when we were in charge, news organizations were in charge of the public sphere, you were legally liable for that. We were governed by a set of standards and ethics that our public can see, that our public can hold us accountable. When tech took over that role, um, 
took they took the money, they yeah. took the business model, but at the same time, they abdicated responsibility for protecting us. Uh, you know, the Cambridge Analytica whistleblower, Chris Wiley, actually pointed out that the toaster in your home has more regulations governing it <laughs> than this, than this. This device that you're carrying. Which is yes. actually manipulating your emotions, ultimately your mind, ultimately your yeah. vote. Well, let's talk about your home country because we have often heard social media disinformation. Essentially, the Philippines is like the canary in the coal mine when it comes to that. Explain what that, what that looks like to you. It's really interesting. Part of it is we were first adapters to the tech, right? I mean, look, I, I drank the Kool-Aid in 2011 when I saw the Arab Spring. Mm -hmm. I was, we set up Rappler in 2012. I thought technology could help jumpstart development. But by 2014, so it was only a year or so, Arab Spring became the Arab Winter. And, uh, and we continued to grow, but we couldn't, we couldn't have fathomed what happened in 2016. So the two biggest stories of my career mm. have been attacks against America tested in the Philippines, mm. attacks against the West. Vali Nasser, let me set up this next question to you by quoting something that you wrote in Foreign Affairs magazine last month. And I'll ask our director, Sheldon Osman, to bring up the graphics so people at home can read along as well. Saudi Arabia, you wrote, has set the ambitious goal of becoming an advanced industrial economy as well as a cultural and tourism hub by the year 2030. Achieving this will require U.S. military support, Israeli security and technology, trade with Europe and China, and domestic stability. The Saudi strategy is at odds with Washington's conception of regional security, which favors isolating Iran and does not rule out war, though there is no clear U.S. plan to manage it. In effect, Riyadh is showing that if U.S. policy does not serve Saudi interests, then the Saudis will not be beholden to the alliance. Okay, let's pick up on that. Saudi Arabia used to be in favor of isolating Iran, clearly not anymore. What happened? Well, because the strategy did not uh, satisfy their needs. Uh, they, they want, they, it didn't end the war in Yemen. It did not uh, remove the Iranian threat to oil facilities, to their infrastructure. And in fact, it, uh, the, the escalation in the region created a situation where they would be uh, bloodied if, if it came to war with Iran. So Saudi Arabia has very clear objectives. Uh, it, it, it obviously uh, wants Iran to be caged. It wants issues in Yemen. In, in Lebanon, in Iraq, in Syria address, but it also uh, needs security in the region to pursue its uh, it, its agenda of, of economic growth, of being the hub of the region. And I think there was a lack of a lack of a, uh, a confidence in that the United States' policy would get them there. So they decided to take things into their own into their own hands. And let me do a quick follow up with you in as much as which of the two countries do you think was more anxious to get this agreement in place? I mean, Iran has been much more anxious for much longer. They have been wanting to mend fences with Saudi Arabia uh, at least for the past five years. They, they, they made overtures. The Saudis were not biting. Even uh, the, the negotiations in Oman and, and, and Iraq, Iranians were much more eager to get to recognition. But the Saudis wanted guarantees. They wanted to make sure that the Iranians would do their part. And they, and they waited and waited until the opportunity came to, to leverage the Chinese to get what they wanted in terms of guarantees from Iran. Okay, Hussein Ibish, I'm going to do the same with you that I just did with Vali Nasser, namely read back something you wrote the other day for Bloomberg, mm -hmm. and here it goes. The Middle East, you write, is entering a multipolar era, and Saudi Arabia is maneuvering to find its place in this new reality. Washington understands this and indeed sees benefits in these evolving arrangements that it anyway cannot prevent. Despite the huge range of commitments, Saudi Arabia was extremely careful not to agree to anything that violates the fundamental American red line. Basically, don't do anything that gives China an undue strategic foothold in this crucial region. Okay, the headline on your piece in Bloomberg was, a flirtation with China won't rock the Saudi-US marriage. And that's what I want to follow up on. Are you really sure that um, Xi Jinping's charms are, are not going to get in the way of the U.S.-Saudi relationship? 
Uh, 100% sure. Uh, China is not the threat to the U.S.-Saudi relationship, though there is one. I mean, I, I just want to say that China has emerged beyond its role of simply buying energy from Gulf countries into one where they do have an important and interesting diplomatic role. The U.S. couldn't broker this agreement. Uh, I, we heard talk before about uh, China being a security guarantor. It can't be a security guarantor. It doesn't have a security presence in the region. Only the United States as an outside power is uh, capable of playing that role. But obviously, Iran is not uh, neither talking to the United States nor interested in American guarantees under current circumstances. So the Chinese were able to play a useful role that I think was welcomed by everybody, including very cautiously by the United States. But I mean, ultimately, what you're looking at is, is a situation where the United States and Saudi Arabia remain uh, wedded to each other because they don't have alternatives. Or the United States, especially after uh, Russia's invasion of Ukraine, I think a lot of people in Washington, uh, strategic planners, have pulled out the maps and recalculated the global strategic landscape. And one of the things I think they realized is that U.S. security control and, and coordination over the three waterways around the Middle East, around Southwest Asia, that's uh, the, the Persian Gulf, the Arabian Sea and the Red Sea, plus the three choke points there, the Suez Canal, Bab al-Mandab at the mouth of the Red Sea and the Strait of Hormuz, is one of, if not the single biggest, geostrategic competitive advantage that the United States has over uh, rivals like China. So obviously working with local uh, you know, uh, partners like Saudi Arabia, and Egypt, Israel, UAE, Qatar, Bahrain, this is extremely important to the United States. So it's no longer a question of oil for security or we protect you so you manage the oil markets for us. It's something much more mutual. It's starting to look a lot more like the US relationship with uh, some European countries. I'm not thinking Britain and France, but you know, maybe Poland or Italy, something like that. The provincial organization responsible for implementing these huge projects is called Metrolinx. Do you have confidence in Metrolinx's ability to bring this in? Absolutely do. Um, this isn't the only the largest transit agency uh, in our country. I, Look, you gotta sometimes feel for them. They, ha they have to run the day-to-day -day operations of the largest transit agency in Canada, but they also have been tasked with the largest transit expansion plan uh, in Canadian history. I mean, the, you're looking at 70 plus billion dollars when it comes to transit uh, investments alone. Um, monumental tasks, then throw on top of that modernizing fares with presto payments, talk about uh, fair service integration. They have a lot on their plate is what I'm saying, Steve. And I know that they have a great team over there. I communicate with them regularly. I, I know the CEO and I, Phil Verster, we have regular conversations, whether it be through text or phone calls or meeting face to face to say these are some big priorities, uh, but I know they're up to the task and they'll deliver for us. And, and, but they're in the, in the middle of, I don't know if they're still in the middle of lawsuits, but they were in the middle of lawsuits. Are they still with two of the organizations that are supposed to be building this LRT? Well, anything that's uh, in front of the courts, I mean, we'd have to leave there, but uh, this, this expansion plan as we move forward, they, they have a lot of conversations, consultations with the communities that are involved. Uh, monumental task, as I said, and we trust our partners to deliver on those outcomes. Who do, I mean, uh, this question is based on the conversations I have with people who, you know, because we're here, right? We're, we're right along Eglinton, and I talk to lots of people all the time about this, and one of the things they want to know is, who do you blame for the dog's breakfast that this LRT has become? What's the answer? <laughs> well, I'm an optimist, Stephen. You know, look, different political stripes, uh, you can blame them all you want till you're blue in the face. Uh, the point is, it doesn't matter who it was, over decades and decades. This isn't a problem of, of lacking transit that happened overnight. This is decades of poor planning decisions and simply not getting shovels in the ground from all levels of government at all political stripes. Um, I think we can learn lessons from the mistakes past. The point is now we have the largest transit expansion plan in Canadian history. Mm. I think it's time to roll up our sleeves, work together to actually get this thing built, and that's what I'm focused on. Last question. It does feel, you can tell me if I'm wrong, but it does feel as if it's almost impossible nowadays for some legitimate and some illegitimate reasons to bring big infrastructure projects in on time and on budget. Does it feel that way to you too? 
I'm, uh, as I said, Steve, a big optimist. You can be an optimist, but be a realist but, but as well. But I'm also being a realist, and that's where I'm going with that. I think that when you have a project of this size, you know the infrastructure investments in this province uh, across the transportation network, uh, as well as transit, are, are over $99 uh, billion. It is by far the most aggressive infrastructure in terms of just transit and transportation planning uh, and investments we have ever seen in this country. And I think that's very meaningful. Now, when you have that much work on your plate and moving um, yeah, at, at that speed, yeah, there, there are going to be a lot of conversations had. There's going to be a lot of, uh, you know, uh, different entities, agencies, uh, broader public sector uh, companies uh, involved in that. But I think, I think generally we're heading in the right direction. When you look at the priorities that we're putting into the skilled trades to actually have the people to fill those jobs that we're creating, getting rid of streaming, it's as simple as that from the education system to allow more kids to enter the skilled trades. Uh, you heard Minister Lecce announce that there will be now an, a, a co-op internship uh, opportunity straight out of high school into some of those uh, highly needed uh, uh, jobs of the future. And I think uh, it's working. You remove $8 billion from, from doing the cost of business here in Ontario every single year. And since 2018, there's been a, a net gain of 600,000 good paying jobs in this province. And I think that's what we need to focus on is that, look, Steve, if I may, my, my dad and my mom came to this country 50 years ago with little more than the shirts on their back. And they worked seven days a week tirelessly to try and make ends meet. And they live that Canadian dream. Because when my dad and my mom retired, they employed 200 families uh, throughout the greater Toronto area. Mm -hmm. If we want to keep that world-class uh, quality of life, because for those hundreds of thousands of people that are moving here every single year, it's going to take that bold investments into the infrastructure. It's going to take that bold vision to say, you know what, what was good for us back then, 50 years ago, has to be good enough, just as good for the people as we move forward. Critical services include getting people connected and going from point A to point B, and that's what we're focused on. That's just some of what we covered this week. You can find more, including the full conversations, on our website, tvo.org, our YouTube channel at youtube.com slash the agenda, or our Twitter feed, twitter.com slash the agenda. The Agenda with Steve Pakin is made possible through generous philanthropic contributions from viewers like you. Thank you for supporting TVO's journalism.